So, hi, good morning, and um, welcome to this open air uh, public webinar. Uh, this webinar uh, will be about Zenodo, the open digital uh, repository. But uh, before we start, I just want to give you some um, housekeeping rules that you already know. So um, this uh, session is being recorded. Um, we ask to all the participants to have your microphones and cameras off while the, the speakers um, make uh, their presentations. Uh, if you want to participate, you know you can use the chat to introduce yourself, to interact with other participants or write questions and address questions to the, to the speakers. Or at the end, uh, we will have a Q&A session where you can uh, raise your hand to, to speak or, or just um, write your, your question or comment in the chat. Um, the presentation and the recording will be made available uh, by you via email and via our channels. We are going to, to upload the, the record in the Open Air YouTube channel and the, the presentation also in the, our web website. So if you want to share uh, uh, any comments in social media, please tag us and uh, identify our um, accounts on Twitter, on Facebook and on LinkedIn. So um, share this activity in, and your comments about this session. So uh, as I said today, uh, we have um, this public webinar about Zenodo, the Open Digital Repository, and we have our colleagues from CERN responsible for developing this, this tool, Jose Benito and Pablo um, Panero. So um, now, without further ado, I, I just give the floor to Pablo, and thank you so much for being here uh, today to, to present this, uh, to, to present Zenodo. Thank you. So, hello everybody. Uh, just before we get started quickly, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, all good. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Paula. Um, so my name is Pablo Panero, and today I'm gonna talk to you about um, Zenodo. But before we dive into what Zenodo is and, and how it works, uh, I want to take you through a very quick uh, story, right? So imagine you're a researcher and you're on your way to work. It's uh, the morning, it's very early and you're slightly sleepy. So you lost your laptop, you forgot it there. And I want to bring your attention to the second paragraph, which says crucial scientific data plus many years of work inside. And all of that, of that was lost. Or another potential case, which is that, uh, you know, a colleague was working late at night and wanted a coffee, but the machine short circuit and burned the lab down. Uh, it might be slightly an extreme example, but all the work, all the data was lost. Um, maybe less extreme, but who here has never lost a pen drive? Or just simply deleted data by mistake. Um, the result of all these actions are quite uh, catastrophic, uh, so, so to say. Um, there's studies that show that 50% of the links in papers are inaccessible after 10 years. So if you're you know, doing your literature review and you want to cross-check some references or get the data that was used to try a new technique, you cannot because you cannot access it. And if you go in line to that and take it one step further, uh, for example, 80%, 89% of the 53 most important cancer research papers are irreproducible. There was an effort that took around eight years and two million US dollars trying to reproduce this research to see if we are basing ourselves on correct assumptions or not. But this is a waste of money and time. We should be progressing. We should not be repeating what was already done. So it is clear that we need to improve. 
we need to improve in how we disseminate and archive uh, information and research um, to make it accessible. So those links, you know, when you click, you can access it. Uh, to in reproducibility, so those eight million, uh, eight eight years and two million US dollars should not be that amount. Should just be one click. A person says, okay, I want to see if this is valid. I do one click and I can check it. And also in reusability. We don't know what we do today, what's gonna to be used for in the future. As an example, ship logs from the 18th century that were used to, to navigate the, the seas, to know where they were going, nowadays are used for climate research. So we also need to enable that. So this could be summarizing what we need to improve in how we do science. To do science, we need to be able to explain how we got to a piece of knowledge, to, to understand it, and then be able to repeat the process to the how we got there uh, to verify. So then we can progress. So we don't redo what was already done. So now you might be wondering, how do we improve? How do we do that? Well, I'm here to talk to you about Zenodo, right? Um, but that's a, a very beautiful page, but what's actually Zenodo? So in a nutshell, Zenodo is an open digital repository for the long tail of science where researchers can publish their research outputs, artifacts like uh, posters, presentations, uh, data, software, everything that's related to their research in three simple steps. The first one is to, to upload the data, right? Then to, to describe it, to give some information and finally publish it to make it available to the world. But let's go in a, in a bit more detail on, this, on these three steps. So the first one is actually to upload the files. At least one, you need to upload a file. It doesn't matter the format, we accept every format. And there's a limitation on 50 gigabytes per, per Zenodo record, per publication. Once you've uploaded your, your data, you need to, to give information about it. Zenodo has a very rich, but flexible metadata schema based on data site. And there's a lot of information that you can uh, give uh, about your, your publication. And once you do that, you just need to click one button, the publish button. That's how you will make it available to the world. And you will get this, what we call landing page. There is a place where you get displayed all the information that you gave us, plus the data, plus all the things like views and downloads uh, about your uh, publication. And that way you also get a DOI or digital object identifier, which can be used to cite, uh, for example, your data and your research and other researchers can also use it to cite um, your, your, your records. But you might be wondering why a DOI is just a fancy blue box, but it's not a DOI. It's um, an identifier that will always resolve. It will always point to, uh, let's say, your data, your publications. So all those 50% of links that were not accessible after 10 years, now they are. It doesn't matter how things change uh, below, if the URL changes or not, the URL of the DOI will always resolve to that data. So it will always be accessible. So you, when you go verify sources or to uh, access data sets or other researchers will never be in this situation. Uh, but okay, the fact that data is not available because the link doesn't work is not the only problem. It also the data might change. Okay, so if you change the data with which you, you made a, a certain publication, that might not apply. So in that sense, after publishing a record in Zenodo, the, the data cannot be changed. You cannot modify the files uh, and you cannot update them. You can edit the metadata. Imagine you forgot to mention something in the description or there's a typo or you want to add uh, something else. You can, but you cannot modify the files. But you may say, okay, I had a data set two years ago. I did a publication with it, but now over the next two years, we, we took more data in and it grew. Uh, I want to also publish that. Well, you don't need to do it separately. You can create a new version. Uh, same that we do with software, like version one, two, and three. You can do the same with data sets, okay, uh, and your publications. 
that means that the the old data set is still available and it's still valid for the old publications and the new one will uh, be available for the new publications and they are related so people if they access the old data set they will get a banner on the top of the page saying okay there's a new one in case you're interested and once you have all your versions and all your records you might be wondering how many people are actually interested in my work how many people are downloading uh, my data or viewing my publications so for that we have what we metrics and statistics is like instagram likes but uh, for research um, we use the counter code of practice uh, for research data usage metrics or make data count which is basically a standard on how to count views and downloads of these publications so we all do it in uh, in the same uh, metric and it can be compared imagine you publish your data set in Zenodo but you know you know the repositories too if we all count the same you can compare and also aggregate and see the full impact of uh, your research so you get all these by following three simple steps and publishing on on Zenodo another next question is okay I uploaded in Zenodo and I uploaded many things but my institute or you know the people of my project we want to have our own place our own group because we only are interested in in this part Zenodo has a lot of information a lot of records and we want to search among only our uh, content so for that we have what we call communities which is basically a way to um, create semantically meaningful groups like for example all the COVID uh, related data set and research or the Lucerne Open Repository that is there, the NASA Transform for Open Science project. It's a way to group uh, content. Uh, but OK, I talked a lot about uh, features and so on. Let's see how it looks uh, a bit in, in reality. Um, so for that, I'm going to show uh, a, few, a few videos. Uh, if I put it in full screen does it still show or we need to share the other screen and someone quickly confirm it's okay okay thank you very much so on this first step um we're gonna create uh, a community okay we're gonna create one of these uh, semantically uh, meaningful groups um first of all you know you go to zenodo uh i'm using what it's called zambok.zenodo.org which is exactly the same that Zenodo, but it's just for testing when you are not familiar with the platform and you want to play around. So first of all, I would sign up. OK, I would need to create an account. You can do it by, you know, just giving your email or if you already have a GitHub or Orchid account, you can log in or sign up with that. In my case, I already have an account, so I go to the login page. And once I go in, I go to the communities tab on the top and there I can search what are the, the communities that already exist. Um, but in my case, I will want to create a new one. So I go to the bottom on the top right and I get a form where I can put an identifier, a title, give a description about the, the community and let's say what is, what is the, the purpose of it, um, explain a bit the curation policy, what are the conditions for, for a record to be to be accepted in, in this community. And finally, you can, for example, give a, a web page if you have an external one. In this case, I'm just putting open air, for example. You can choose a logo. I didn't, but uh, it's, it's good practice to do. And then you fill the captcha. I was able to find all the buses in the image and finally you click on create this will take you to a, to a page where you can see for example the direct urls to, to perform certain actions will be seen uh, more in in the next videos but you can see that on the right you have your communities and then you you can search for example the upload url to to send to other people so they can add content to to your community Okay. And now that we've created a community, we can also create uh, a record. So we can basically upload 
content. It's not required to create a community, but I'm doing a full example. You can simply, you know, uh, create the records and do not add them to a community. In the same way than before, uh, I log in. In this case, I'm logging in with GitHub, so I so it's a different account from from before. Uh, I go to my uploads. I create a new one, and the first step is to choose the files. So I go, I choose the file, I took the, the first slide of, of this presentation and I click on start upload. So the files start going up. Then I fill in uh, the data. There's four pieces of information that I require, which is the, the type that I put uh, on top. And then the, the publication date, the title, one author and a description, and also the DOI, uh, if it's not, mandatory to reserve it beforehand as I just did. Uh, if you don't, once you publish, one will be assigned automatically. But in case, for example, you want to know what's going to be your DOI because you are already um, writing the bibliography for your publication and you want to, to be able to cite it, you, you can already get the, the DOI before uh, publishing. And um, yeah. Well, I put, I, Fill in the rest of the form. I, I skip the ORCID, but you can also add it. And then there's plenty of information. You can choose a type of, of access. Okay, you can say it's open access, or you can say that the files are embargoed, restricted, or fully closed. You can choose a license, it's a search box, okay? So by default, it's uh, Creative Commons Attribution 4, but you can search for, I don't know, GPL, AGPL, and many other variations. We harvest them from SPDX. Same with the grants. You can search for your specific grant. And in the bottom, you have many uh, collapse fields that you can give plenty of information about your publications. If it's, uh, if it's uh, published in a journal, if it's a, a thesis, or, or many other uh, pieces of information. And then I go to the top and I save, okay? That means that it's a draft. It's uh, the, the information that I already filled in is safe and I want to add it to a community. This case to the one that I created previously, the Open Air webinar. So I search for Open Air uh, and I see the, the actual Open Air community. So I search for Open Air webinar and we can find the community that we created in the previous video. And now I click again in save and publish. It will tell me that, okay, uh, there's a, um, that afterwards I cannot change the files. I say, I understand. And I publish the record and I get what's called before the, the landing page, which I can preview a file. I can see my views and download. Nobody did it yet, it's zero. <laughs> um, and yes, but this means that the record was published. It's in Zenodo, but it's not available yet in the community that we created before. For that, we need to uh, go to the previous account, right? So for the person that owns the community, um, we go to our community, we click on actions, and we want to curate. This means that the person that owns the community has the right to say, okay, your record is accepted or your record is not accepted. It, does it fulfill the, the criteria, the curation um, uh, policy or not? In this case, let's say yes, uh, I could you know access the record to to verify it, but then I can also just click accept, and then we we can go to the community, uh, and we can view, and we can see that uh, the record uh, is there. So. This is basically the end of the of, of this part of, of the demo, and we learned how to create a community in case we want a specific grouping of our content, how to upload content, and how to uh, accept or reject uh, content into our community. But it might be that you have many publications per day, let's say you, I don't know, 50 or, or something like this, and you want to automate this process, or you have certain tools that you want to integrate uh, with Zenodo. Zenodo was built with a REST API first in mind. That means that everything can be um, 
uh, all the actions can be carried out by doing uh, HTTP requests. Um, so you can integrate your systems with, with Zenodo. And also, uh, in case you want the opposite action, not just pu publish, but uh, get content from Zenodo, you can harvest, uh, I don't know, for example, a community using the OAI PMH um, protocol. And I've been talking a lot about publishing data, publishing data, publishing data, but in order to reproduce, to, to enable progress, as I said at the beginning in, in science, uh, we also need the code, we also need the scripts. Uh, how, how was that data uh, used? So for that, there's already a very well-known and, and uh, popular uh, code repository, which is uh, GitHub. And if you have your code there, Every time you create a, a tag or a release, which is basically a snapshot of, of your code at a specific point in time, and you have the integration with Zenodo configured, then a publication will be directly uh, done in, in Zenodo. So then you have your paper, your, your journal article that is published, and then you also have the data in Zenodo, you have also the code in Zenodo, and everything can be cited, and it's almost ready to, to reproduce. We have the data, we have the software, but someone has to run it. Sometimes it's easy to, to run things, but sometimes it works in your computer, but it doesn't work in mine. Um, if this were the case, there is another service at CERN, uh, which is called Rihanna from uh, Re uh, Reusable Analysis. And you have a link to their documentation on the top uh, right of, of their logo. And how this would work is that they enable you to actually run uh, the code. If you create what's called a, a workflow file, which is basically telling how the code should be run uh, with the data and so on, and you can find more on how to do that in their documentation, um, you will get uh, a banner like um, uh, execute uh, launch in, in Rihanna. And that means that with one click, it could be uh, fully uh, reproducible. Uh, this, this integration is still in the in the prototype uh, phase, but uh, it's working. For example, there you have someone clicked on that uh, button and started executing the uh, excess mortality data processing. So those two million US dollar and eight years of work could have been summarized in one click. And with that, I conclude that that is Zenodo part and. Um, how uh, how to use it. And I hope by now I convince you on why you need to use a repository. That's basically to prevent research invalidation because in Zenodo, for example, data cannot be changed, cannot be removed. It will be there when someone comes looking for it. And we need to improve citability and findability. It cannot be that when someone clicks on a URL uh, from a research paper, it's not available anymore. And why a repository also, you might think, okay, I can just put that in, in, I don't know, on a server I have at home or in Google Drive or something like that. But in that case, uh, you are in charge. Uh, it might be that 20 years from now, you don't remember that you put that there, you run out of storage, you're doing a cleanup, you remove it. There's nothing telling you, hey, don't remove this because it still might be, uh, need to be found for this paper or a company uh, it's in control and we already have cases like a mercurial bit bucket or google code that they were phased out and uh, basically those links were, are very hard to find nowadays and i hope by now also i um, convince you of uh, using zenodo but we need to know when to use zenodo uh, zenodo is a digital repository for the long tail of science uh, if, for example, in your domain of work, there's already a repository because there are many, it's highly probable that those uh, integrate better with your tools. Uh, so if that's the case, use them. If your institution provides a repository, maybe it's better to use them, but there's many that do not have a home. There's many research outputs that there's no place to, to put. And that's why Zenodo exists for, is for the long tail of science. And you might be thinking that there is not many people, there's not many research like that, but there is. Even use another in numbers, there's around 3 million records at the moment. Uh, 
uh, half of those 1.6 million are, are text publications. Uh, but I want to bring the attention to 220,000 software publications that accounts for approximately 80%, 85% of the whole world software DOIs. Those are hosted at Zenodo. In terms of data, we have 1.3 petabytes, which accounts for 10 million files. And we have up to today, there's still one month to go in the year, 25 million visitors. And if you see the graph on the top right, we are growing very fast. We also have around 300,000 uh, active registered users from 7,500 uh, 7, uh, research institutions. And from those institutions, the users, 50% are in Europe, but the long tail of science is not only in Europe, we have users from 153 countries. And this is very spread, it's very diverse. For example, the top institute uh, in terms of users has 500 users. So it's not just one institute using uh, Zenon. And then if you belong to the long tail and you want to uh, publish something, you might be wondering why is Zenodo? Well, so far we have a very good track record over the last 10 years uh, of, of experience in, in the field. We, we are open source. You can find all the code of Zenodo and the framework below in, in Vino, in, in GitHub. So in that sense, we, we practice what we preach. Uh, we do our best to adhere to, to best practices in research. So just from publishing Zenodo, you get uh, a lot of things to help disseminate, to index your publications in many places and, and so on. And there's a sustainability and archiving plan. Uh, Zenodo is hosted uh, in CERN's data center and it's in our best interest to CERN uh, to help improve how we do science. And as part of a large organization such as CERN, there's many services and technologies that we already have available that we can make uh, use of. And I hope now I convince you why to use another and you know when to use another, but it might be the case that you have certain restrictions uh, and you want your repository. For example, my institution, we need the, the data of our publications to be hosted in our servers because of, I don't know, uh, some law. And you're not alone. There's many of those that we call Zenodo clones. Basically, they wanted a repository with this, the functionality that, that Zenodo is providing, uh, but they need to be you know, hosted on their, ser on their, their servers, for example. Um, so they took the code from Zenodo, from GitHub, and they deployed it uh, on, their, on, on their site. Uh, nothing wrong with that. The only issue is that Zenod is a service, it's not a product, so it may be that um, we implement new functionalities, the code evolves, and we unintentionally break something that was working for you because you did it differently, or it might be that someone we don't know, it's implementing a feature that we are also implementing a that feature, so we are duplicating efforts, we're redoing the same thing. Uh, so from this, uh, a project called Invino RDM uh, was born. Uh, it's a turnkey um, research data management solution based on Invino and Zenodo. And the idea behind it is that you get a repository with features like Zenodo, and you can just brand it. You can change how it looks. You can configure certain functionalities, and you can get your own uh, repository without the problem of it maybe breaking in the future is a community effort to maximize maximize impact and optimize the efforts and we're doing it with uh, 25 partners all around the world uh, there's institutions there's businesses there's everything it's a very welcoming community you can find us online in our discord server and when i say us i don't mean just certain people this is a community project there's a lot of people there's people in every time zone almost. So there's always someone uh, answering the, the questions. Uh, there's a link on the top right. And sometimes, you know, when the world uh, conditions uh, allow it, we also do live events. It's always nice to meet uh, in person and to collaborate. Uh, there you can see us playing with uh, stickers in a, in a workshop. 
The whole project is again open source under MIT license. And if you want to know how you can collaborate and what's the, the code of conduct and so on, you can also find it on the link on the bottom right. But coming back to the project, <clears throat> as I said, in Vineyard RDM, it's the idea of having uh, a repository that you can um, configure uh, to your needs. Uh, it's a collaborative, collaborative repository platform and we want to empower users like GitHub does with uh, the organizations. They can manage the members in there. They can manage the, the pull requests uh, to add code to, to the repositories and so on. And it was born with two guiding principles. Scalability, because it needs to power very big repositories like Zenodo, and user experience. We want our users to be the utmost happy when they're using our service. And how does it look today? So there's already many uh, instances of Invinio RDM. As you can see, every one looks different. On the top left, you have the default, like if you install it, that's what you get. But then you have the one from uh, the Technical University of Graz, the Technical University of Vienna, uh, Prism from uh, Northwestern University in the US. Uh, there's also the latest production one is uh, Caltech Data from Caltech Library. But it's true that none of these <clears throat> are Zenodo. So that's what we call now uh, Zenodo RDM. We are not changing the name, but Zenodo RDM is basically the project that we are announcing later today. And it's the umbrella of the migration from the current Zenodo on top of this new uh, product called Invino RDM. And we are aiming uh, for that to be in production in autumn uh, 2023. We will have regular communication uh, about it in the usual channels, uh, Twitter, blog posts, and so on. But let's go to what's new. Why are we doing that migration? So going on the steps of the publishing, the first thing was to actually upload the data. Um, now, how to upload it change a bit. You can see on the top right uh, the, the quota, then you select your files. And actually, you see that it uploaded immediately. There's no need to click on the Start Upload button. And on the left, you can see, imagine you have a list of 100 files. You can say which one is the one that's going to preview in the landing page. It's not always the first. Then. Going to the second step, which was filling in the data. Uh, there's now auto completion for many of the fields. There's a better search suggesting, filtering, and again, auto completing the, the values. For example, for languages, you can search, start typing ENG and it will suggest you all the available languages. And uh, this is also uh, true for um, languages, subjects, authors, but for licenses. We improved how to choose a license. You can um, <clears throat> click on add license and you can filter on the top right by data and software. And then you can also search, for example, for uh, creative and you will get the Creative Commons uh, licenses. There's also a description on it. And I said, we improved authors. Right. So we have integrated with ORCID. So that means that we got the dump from all the ORCID uh, database. And now when you want to add a creator uh, of your publication, you can just search by the name. For example, I'm searching for my, my colleague, Jose, and I click and all the data gets pre-filled. The, the ORCID identifier, the affiliation, and so on. And then you save, and that's it. It was easier. You didn't need to pre-fill all the information uh, on each creator. Then. The same was done for uh, affiliations. Uh, we, in this case, we got the ROR dump. Um, and now when, in this case, I feel uh, I didn't search for a user, I put my, my name and I want to say that I, you know, I'm affiliated with CERN. So I search and I can find all the affiliations that are in the ROR dump. Might also be that the affiliation was not found. So you can also add, in this case, I'm just typing another because I know it's not gonna be found. Uh, and you can add uh, your own. 
And then that's it about how to fill in the, the form. Once you publish, you can also get a link to share. Before it's just the, the link or, or the UI, but now imagine your data is closed and you have peer reviews or you want to share it with your colleagues uh, or embargo, for example, and you want to share with your colleagues, you can get a link and you know choose if they can edit the metadata, if they can just view the files and so on, then you get a link and you can share that with them. There's no need like in the past to do a, a request. Uh, and finally, the, the biggest uh, change, which is in how we manage communities. I said before that we want to empower uh, the users um, to self-manage their communities. So now they can manage members and there's what we call inclusion requests. But if you're familiar with GitHub, you could understand it as a pull request, more or less. Uh, but let's look uh, how that, that, that works. So. First of all, uh, explain a bit the video. So on the top left, there's two browsers and on the top left, uh, there's me, let's say Pablo. So this is simulating two people. And on the bottom right, there's there's Jose, okay? And uh, we're using a Zenodo RDM instance. Jose will create a community and reproducing more or less the same things that we saw in the previous videos, but in the new Zenodo RDM. You can see the, the existing communities and you can create a new one. You just need to, to give the name and then the, the identifier. That's what's gonna happen, what's gonna be available in the, in the URL. And afterwards you can see that you can give a lot of information about it, uh, add a website, a description and so on. And there are some tabs that we're gonna see later uh, about requests and members and so on. But now imagine that me, Pablo, I want to upload a record and I want to add it to that community that Jose created. So I go to my dashboard where I can see my communities, my requests, but in this case, I'm interested in uploading content. So I click on new upload. Fill in the form. The first is just uploading the file. So I choose it and it uploads. Then I don't have a DUI, so I want one. I fill in the resource type the title, I add the creators. I will search in this case, for example, for Jose. And I will add myself, not refilling, but just, you know, inputting data that is not in the database. I do have an ORCID, but I didn't add it for this <laughs> demo. And then uh, after that, there's more information on the bottom, but I, I keep it simple in this demo. I save the draft and I start looking for a community. Uh, the opener webinar is the first, but just to showcase that you can search. I search for, for a webinar and the community will appear. I select it. I save the draft and then I can preview. Preview doesn't mean publish. Preview means that, you know, this is how it's gonna look. Once it's published, this is how it's gonna look. For example, you wanted to check if the HTML that you put in the description displays properly or if the preview file is the correct uh, one that you can preview and then submit for review. This is not publishing, this is submit for review, this change from the past. And you can see on the first tick that I did, it says that uh, I'm giving view and edit permission to the curators, to, to the people that own the community to actually edit my metadata, my files. Then you can send a message, okay? And you submit for review. You can see uh, that it started an inclusion request and there's a place where the, you can have a conversation and discuss things about the record in case they need to be changed because of curation policy or similar things. So now if we go back to Jose, Jose will go to the community and then to the requests and see that, okay, Pablo wanted to add this record to the community. Could accept or decline as before, but now can also go check it and have a conversation. Imagine that Jose saw it and then thinks that something needs to be changed. Can edit by himself, but can also say, okay, 
I'm not going to edit, but I'm going to ask Pablo. Okay, I would like you to add a description on the files and change the title with this format, for example. Uh, once it commented, imagine Pablo did it. <laughs> Pablo will see the comment and imagine it implemented the, the changes. And then Jose can go and accept, saying, okay. Now it's correct. And accept the publication. Now we could see the record in the um, community. If we go to the search tab. You can see there the record. It's in the community already. Now imagine that time passes. The community became po very popular. And there's a lot of requests. And there's a lot of records that need to be checked. And Jose cannot check all of them or imagine someone, the owner of the community is retiring and you want to, to allow more people to, to curate the community. So you can manage the members. You can invite people to help you do that. In this case, I'm gonna invite Pablo because I know uh, he uploaded good content. So I search for, for the name or, or the email, okay? And I can say, in this case, there's several roles, but I'm gonna say it's a curator. So Pablo can actually accept those records in the community. We send the, the invitation. It lasts for 30 days and you can change the role and so on. But now if we go back to Pablo, <clears throat> Pablo will go to the dashboard, to the request tab, and we'll see, okay, I've been invited to this. You could also click on it and again, have a conversation, uh, but you can also accept. And that means that, if, for example, now Jose can go to the members tab of the of the community and see that, okay, Jose is still the owner, but there's also Pablo, which is a curator. Uh, and that way you can manage who has uh, permissions on your community, uh, who can help you, who can, you have, can have multiple owners, for example, you can also remove uh, users if, if needed uh, from that community. And that way we are empowering um, the users to, manage their own uh, groups, let's say. And that's it on the demo of community management. Oops. No, I'm changing slide. Okay. So <clears throat> this was a lot of information, a lot of new features. Uh, if you want to play with it, um, you can find it in zenodo-rdm.web.cn.ch. This is a new site we put on, is the foundations for this migration project that I, I mentioned. And it's the place where we will, you know, try new features. You can also try them. And we will test with our partners like Open Air, Dryad, and so on. But a heavy disclaimer, this site is under development. That means that there's no guarantees. What you publish today there can be removed a few hours later or a few days later. Uh, hopefully not, but it can also be down at, at times. So it's just a uh, you know playground uh, site. We will keep uh, you updated again on the on the progress uh, in the blog post and Twitter and all the, the usual channels. And with this, I conclude the presentation. Uh, I hope I convince you to publish your research artifacts uh, to make it citable, and I hope you can do it easily. Thank you very much. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you so much, Pablo, for for your presentation, for for being for being so detailed, and um, this was very enlightening presentation about uh, the possibilities of using Zenodo and uh, the and and now with the with the Inverno RDM also. Uh, we have we have some questions here. I will I will go through them. Uh, I think Pablo just answered one. And uh, we will try to until the the time we have to to address all the doubts that were posed here in the in the chat. So, Dirk Theron says a quick question. Will uh, it's about the presentation? So uh, Bernard Forks, uh, Pablo, or Jose already answered. Lorenzo Manella says, is there a way to edit the curator's contact within the community? 
as of today, only we uh, only one contact can be set as curator and modifications look impossible. It would be nice to have multiple curators or at least included uh, options to share curation feedbacks to additional email address. Thank you. I think in the presentation you already answered this, no? Yes, so um, this is one actually, it is one of the, of the features we, we get requested. Uh, in Zenodo, in the actual Zenodo right now, you cannot do it. It's only one owner, one curator. But as I showed in the in the community management, once we migrate to to Zenodo RDM, this get gives you a lot of power over it. You can choose multiple curators, multiple owners. So the answer is yes. Once we migrate, uh, it's it will be possible. Yeah. Okay. So another question uh, from Efigenius Vlachus. Is there as another API, API uh, something similar to SCVAL? Um, there is uh, as another API, uh, you can find information about it in uh, developers.zenodo.org. Uh, that's a documentation for that. And I'm not sure I understood the, the last part. Uh, similar to uh, SCEVAL. Uh, I don't know if uh, Ifigenius is here and want to open the microphone and uh, maybe to help us out understanding. Uh, Ifigenius says it's from Elsevier, like an API, um, API from, from Elsevier. Uh, I'm not familiar with the, with the Elsevier API. I don't know if. Uh... Michael so wants to add uh, some words to this question. Yes, yes. No, me neither. Okay. I'm, uh, I, I'm not familiar. So, but we, I just shared the link to the, our API. So it's fully explained there. Um, okay. What we can offer, we can do for the API. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll check the, the Elsevier API later on. Thank you. And now Teresa Gomez Diaz says, hello, a question about licenses. Um, I have tried to have other CC license than CC BY, uh, but it's not easy. Could you please show the CC licenses that are available in the deposit page? Yes. Uh, so basically in the... Uh, I just I just see a link. Okay, perfect. Um, to the, to the, so, probably you're looking for that. But. Yeah, thank you. So basically all the licenses we have available are taken and harvested from spdx.org. And it's through the, one of the things, for example, right now in Zenodo, uh, it's not easy to understand that the license field is a search box. So when you click, you only get for CC by four and some other licenses, uh, but you can also search by it and you, Will most likely find the one you're 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 looking for. We have we have also improved that in, in Zenodo RDM. You can filter and you can search in a in a in a better way. Uh, and the list is on the link that uh, Jose sent. Okay. I think I passed one of the questions previously. Um, let me see. Uh, why uh, why don't Zenodo use Andal identifier also? So Joan Pereira is asking. So maybe I can take this one yes, if, uh, if it's okay. Uh, so so we we do use TOIs, right? I mean, in in at the end of the day, we want to provide only per, one persistent identifier, and um, our choice was TOIs. If um, somebody or there are some communities out there that uh, require handles and they want to have it in their own repositories, like with a new Invenior DM that is coming out, they can actually set up and configure whatever identifier they want to uh, to use. And if it is handles, that's a possibility. Um, yeah, from our side, yeah, we, we only provide device. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Jose. And there's another one from Bernard who, uh, who is asking, uh, when you have several versions, um, is the limit 50 gigabytes limit for each version or for all versions together? For each version. Thank you. Uh, and then we have here Teresa Gomez Diaz, uh, the license already, Iphigenia Varda Costa. Is there a way to create a community and gather all the related to that community records uh, that are already uploaded? 
So uh, at the moment, when you create a community, you would need to find a way to contact the, the, the authors, the people that uh, did those uploads. So they request an inclusion uh, to the community. So at the moment, you yeah. can pull content in. Okay. But nevertheless, this is just to complement uh, what uh, Pablo said correctly. Um, so he's right, and at the same time, it's something that we foresee to have in the future. Uh, and we don't know if it is going to come directly with the first version of uh, Senovo RDM, let's say. But we we this is a something that's been requested several times, and we uh, we know it's important. So we will try to put in place a mechanism to. Um, um, you know, to try to get these records into your community and some some way of communicating with the uploader to make it possible. Okay, thank you. Um, if someone wants to address a question, I hear a microphone on. O que crê? O que crê que está? Tem alguma etiqueta que escreveu isso para a grade para ver? Está aqui. Sorry. I'm on with a microphone now. Okay, thank you. Um, we have uh, uh, three questions here from João Pereira. Um, for the purpose of digital preservation, how is the file format identified and validated in Zenodo? Is a droid pronoun or G? H O V A used, for example. Pablo, do you want me to yeah. get this one? Uh, yeah. if that's okay. Um, so for the time being, um, to be honest, our main goal is to enable a way to all users out there to to share data um, in, uh, and and to um, give a DOI to this data in, in a very simple way. So we don't do any post processing after that. So we don't control whether uh, you know uh, the type of the file is preservable for the long term. It, this is something that we're exploring. We have a parallel project uh, to Zenodo in, here at CERN looking at how to improve the long-term preservation aspect of, uh, of uh, the content we are archiving. But for the time being, we just simply get the files. Uh, we store it, uh, we um, keep it in, um, in our storage systems replicated and so on. But we don't we don't look at the at the at the type of the file or do anything about it. I hope I'm not wrong, Pablo. <laughs> totally correct. Okay. Uh, um, and Juan asks also: Are statistics saved for future memory? Uh, do you mean that in the migration, like if we will migrate the the records and the statistics will will be preserved once we we migrate? We don't know, Joao, if uh, that was your question, um, or if you prefer, you can open your microphone. And... If it goes more in the preservation uh, side of, of it, it's, it's basically what, what Jose answered before. Um, I, uh, I, Paula, uh, Joao. Um, uh, yes, uh, the, the, my doubt is uh, if we might, if, if uh, uh, in the process of migration of, of Zenodo to a new uh, version of Zenodo, if you lost the, the uh, if, if I had lost the, the, the statistics in this space, this is a problem, for example. Um, no, the statistics will also be migrated. Okay, thank in, you. In, in that aspect, we're, we're trying to do it as <clears throat> transparent as possible. So let's say at some point we're migrating to, to another RDM, but except for new features and things like this, data should will not be lost. Okay, thank you. Okay, because uh, João has uh, another question is when the platform is updated, does the author still have access to statistics form from the past? Um, Sorry, I didn't. Okay. When, when this platform is updated, does mm -hmm. the author still have access to statistics yes. from the past? Yes, uh, yes. yes. Th okay. things are, are migrated as, as they were. Okay, okay. And another one from Bernard um, Is integration with GitHub uh, only, or we can use alternatives like GitLab? So I know at some point there were some works to do a GitLab integration, but 
<clears throat> the, the, the current integration is, is with GitHub. It's uh, basically, there's also work on the GitHub side. They, they have the, to, to enable the, the repositories and so on, and integration is, is with GitHub. So, yeah, okay. Thank you. I, I, I hope um, Bernard this um, answers your question. Um, and then Sylvie Labras um, asked when you were presenting in Venue RDM, could you tell us, could you tell us uh, more about metadata, the flexibility about metadata? Um, yes. So the, the schema of, of in Vinio RDM and therefore Zenodo RDM is still based on data site. Uh, we, we keep evolving also with the, with the new versions of, of data site. Um, and in terms of, of the flexibility, that, that means that basically uh, there's very little data that is required, um, but you can input a lot of information on it. And again, the, the schema is, is actually the, the one from, from data site. Uh, I'm gonna try to put in the chat the uh, the, page, the documentation page that explains every single field in detail and what are the the options and, and so on. And, and also one more thing is that in this Zenodo RDM we are introducing a new feature which is custom fields, um, which means that we can um, so the installations of Infinity RDM will come with the capacity to expand this uh, data model uh, to yeah with as the name says with custom uh, metadata and and then there will be integrations uh, with um, for instance with specific vocabularies for specific communities like uh, um, mesh um, vocabularies for uh, health sciences okay thank you um Another one, Christine Hofner says, if, for example, a publication later proves having false data of being pleasure, plagio, can it be removed? Is there a kind of an uh, ethics commission that could decide this kind of actions? So we we, we have, uh, sorry, Paula, I'm jumping yeah. on this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we have a very clear terms of use um, as you can find in the footer of the of Zenodo, in, in which we explain you know all the actions and everything that we do and how you can use Zenodo. So if there is a, a copyright infringement, um, this is one of the reasons for which we will take down uh, a record. So there are just a few reasons for that, and then we will do it. We um, uh, yeah, so it happens sometimes, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, I think we only have two, two more. One is for Corey Melsey. Um, will the Zenodo API change after realization to Zenodo RDM? Um, so yes, but no. So there, there is a new API that uh, improves some, some workflows, but there will be backwards compatibility. So that means that if you have an integration, uh, it will still be working. Uh, that there is a new API that improves some workflows, as I said, but it, it will all still work. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Pablo. Um, Alicia asks uh, Are there plans to expand Zenodo into a bigger research platform like Google Scholar, for example, by harvesting metadata from the other non Zenodo repositories? I think those are two different. Um, uh, yeah, objectives or uh, goals on, on the platforms, but maybe Jose, if you want to. No, no you're, you're totally right. Uh, we we don't plan at all, it's not at all in our goals to, to go into the aggregators uh, role, which aggregators, that's what they do, right? They harvest content from many different um, and sources and then unify the, the search. So the, the, the difference between aggregators and repositories is like the other repositories get content, aggregators harvest the content from other sources. So maybe here is just, uh, you know, doing a bit of PR for OpenAir as well. There is OpenAir Explore that is doing that for, um, for research in general, but they're harvesting many different repositories, not only the other 
across the Europe and I think even across the world, right? And they unify yes. this and create a, a big research graph with content from, from everywhere. So no, we are not going to this direction. Yes, yes. And uh, you all can explore a little bit the discovery portal from OpenAir in explore.openair.eu. Yes, Andre already uh, put the link there. Thank you, Andre. Um, I think we have one more. It's the last one um, from Ilra Azimi. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce uh, right the name. Uh, could you please elaborate more on the integration of Rihanna? Rihanna. Yeah. So the integration with Rihanna is still in, in a prototype phase, uh, right? Um, so I cannot give too much. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jose, for, for sending the link uh, to Rihanna. But basically, the idea is that if, if you comply with uh, the format of files and, and the definitions of the workflows that uh, Rihanna accepts, and then, for example, when, when creating this another record, there is a, a workflow.jaml file uh, explaining the steps that need to be run for the for the analysis to be run in, in Rihanna, you will get the batch on your record to, to launch on Rihanna. That also means that, you know, uh, it, it needs to all be uh, functioning in Rihanna. Okay, I hope it helped to clarify a little bit more. So I think we reached the end. Um, I'm just sharing um, an evaluation form that I would like all the participants to give us feedback about this webinar. And um, I would like to uh, thanks, thank again to Pablo and to Jose for this um, amazing webinar that you give here. We had a um, huge audience and I think you made a huge effort to, to explain everything in a detailed way. And even now at the end, to giving answers to all, we at least we try to uh, clarify all the participants here. So um, to all the participants, thank you for being with us. And Jose and Pablo, thank you so much. And uh, please follow our activity, Open Air's activity in the website and social media. So uh, we will meet soon here online. So thank you so much and have a nice day. Thanks to you, I will leave the Thank session open for at least for a few minutes for you to copy past the, some links that you would like to, to have. So thanks again and have a nice day. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.